But I want us to look right now to the Word of God. And if you were not with us this last Sunday, perhaps you're a first-time guest or whatever may be the cause, we're so glad you're here. And I'm actually going to preach the same topic that I did last week. So you know what? We're in a series. And I wasn't even aware of it last week. I just knew that when I finished ministering, it seemed like there was more inside and there was certainly more in my study. And then that Monday, just a, kind of moving in my heart, I didn't even look for it, but the Antioch North that we are in harness with in the spirit, Pastor Simpson, I, I just happened to look and the YouTube was there. And would you believe on that very last Sunday that we were with you, me, Antioch North heard a message called, My Hope Remains. Got on the text. The, the, the bottom line is, I believe the, the Lord is talking to the body of Christ. And so with that, I want to preach to you of my forever hope. My forever hope. And unless the Lord surprises me the way I'm feeling, this series will continue next week as well. That I preached past Sunday. By God's help, today I'm going to preach, and maybe even next Sunday, that I want to talk about my forever hope. Psalm 71, 14 is the hope of what I believe is the psalmist David. He said, I will hope, Psalm 71, 14, I will hope continually and will praise you yet more. But as for me, the NIV says, I will always have hope. And so with that in mind, last week we looked at the hope of David, and today we're going to look at the faith and hope of Abraham. David last week, Abraham today, and if the Lord lets me, next week we'll look at the hope of Paul. So I want to talk about my forever hope, and no matter where you are in your journey with Jesus, I believe God wants us to get something even deeper about this thing called a forever hope. Father, we can do nothing without you. So we agree right now that you would help us, Lord. Anoint my mind. Anoint the ears of your hearers. Let your spirit, oh God, do a work that I can't do. I didn't plan to be here this next Sunday with the same topic, but I am confident that there is more that we need to dive into. And maybe there's even someone new that's joining us today that... The world needs and wants hope and help us, Lord, to see they can show them that they can find it through you. And those that have it in terms of salvation, help us understand through the word what we really have and start living like what we have. In the name of Jesus, I pray. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And lead us closer to you and Praise God. Praise God. Everybody said amen. Amen. My forever hope. When is the last time someone asked you to pray for more hope? Think about that. Have you had somebody come to you and say, Oh, listen, I want you to help. I want you to pray. What do you want me to pray for? Pray that I would have more hope. Well, my guess is that hasn't happened recently, if at all. Especially, though, compared to what you probably have heard and that is, hey, brother, would you pray that I would have more faith? We don't pray for more hope. We, we ask for more faith. And there is no question that we are to grow in faith. I heard that we should experience God, grow in faith, serve others, and go reach the world. The Apostle Paul, when he wrote to the Corinth church in the second book, Chapter 10, he, he made this presumption. He said, as your faith continues to grow. So there's no question that the increase of faith is in the Bible. In fact, the apostles, if you wanted to look there in Luke chapter 17, the apostles themselves asked Jesus to increase their faith. They wanted their faith level to have, get a boost. You know what Jesus said when they said, Lord, increase our faith? He, he said, 
an enormous amount of faith is really not what's necessary. Look at verse 6. Luke 17, 6. He said, If you have the faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Now, are, are we comprehending that? He's saying just a sincere, tiny, active, engaged faith, just the size of a tiny mustard seed, is all that's needed to perform seemingly an impossible supernatural exploit that it could pull up a whole tree or a bush. So hear me today. Faith is necessary. You cannot be saved without faith. But I've often said, we got to be careful, though, that our faith is not placed in our faith. Mm -hmm. That's good. That looks something like this. If I can just fill in the blank enough, if I can just pray enough, if I can just work enough, if I can just whatever enough. When you look at Luke 17, the very context of the apostles' request for more faith was, mm, I don't know if I can do that. If you don't believe me, look at verse 3. What's the whole context here? 17.3. Jesus said, if your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. Now here's the kicker, verse 4. If he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, forgive him. Oh, we can relate to that. That's not my subject. But it's like, hmm, no, I'm not going to forgive you again until you learn your lesson. No, no, no. Jesus said you just keep forgiving them. It's this very tone of the apostles that says, Woo, I'm going to need more faith to be increased in my life to do that. But Jesus was teaching them, you don't need a lot of faith as long as your faith is placed in something that's greater than you. Yeah. Salvation starts, if you need to be saved today, or if you were saved, it starts with just a little faith in a great God in Christ that reconciled himself unto us. He settled the relationship between us and him. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. But look at the next verse, verse 18. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. I'm here to tell you that his sacrifice, his power, his mercy, his, his, uh, his, the price he paid for our salvation is big enough that all you've got to have is just a little faith in a great God in Christ. I'm trying to tell you right now, some people say, oh, I've got to just work harder, see if I can be saved. No, no, no. If you believe Jesus is Lord, if you have faith in him, that faith will lead to obedience and response to the gospel. Are you hearing me? Jesus just said, you just need a little faith to do a great work of salvation. Praise God. Yeah. But understand this. Salvation then includes hope. I asked you the question, has anybody said, pray for me to have more hope? They've said, pray for faith. And I, Jesus said, you don't really need a whole lot of faith. Go to, go to 1 Peter with me, please. 1 Peter chapter number 1. And I'm going to show you how that when you receive salvation, it includes hope. We love those toys that says batteries included. <laughs> when you get saved, hope is included. Watch this. 1 Peter chapter number 1, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great, His abundant, boundless mercy. How many know that that mercy is abundant and boundless and great? Hallelujah. He has given us new birth. I'm reading from the NIV. Uh, the King James says He's begotten us again. That means new birth. What happened? He gave us new birth into a living hope. I've got a hope that's living right now. And how does that happen? Read on. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, when I was born again by the power of his resurrection, if he doesn't come out of that grave that we celebrated a couple weeks ago, you and I aren't saved. But he said, you've got a living hope. But look at verse 4. From that new birth living hope 
to an inheritance. You go from a living hope to an inheritance incorruptible that can never perish. It's undefiled. It can never spoil. It does not fade away. Watch this. Reserved in heaven. I want you to mark that. I want you to think about that. We're coming back to that. That you have hope that's kept in heaven. That's reserved in heaven for you. Praise God. The whole passages I just read, if you look at that in the New Living Translation, it says it is by his great mercy that you've been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Watch this. Now we live with great expectation. How are you living right now? Are you living with an expectation? Look at verse 4. And we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that's kept or reserved in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change. And decay, it doesn't matter what kind of change we're going through. It doesn't matter <clears throat> what we're facing that we weren't expecting. I've got a living hope that goes beyond what I'm seeing and hearing right now. And it says in verse 5, And through your faith, God's protecting you by his power until you receive salvation, which is ready to be revealed on that last day for all to see. Are you hearing what Peter is talking about here? We are yeah. saved by faith but also we're living by faith until we receive that final and ultimate salvation through faith. Praise God. I'm telling you. So what I'm trying to say is if your hope abounds, your faith will increase. Your joy and your peace will increase. You need Bible for that? Romans 15, 13. Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, as you believe through the experience of your faith, so that you may overflow, bubbling over with what? With hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you yeah. that when I talk about hope, I'm talking about a Bible hope. That word hope literally means to anticipate, often with pleasure. It means expectation. It means a confidence. It's a hope. It is the expectation of something good, and I'm expecting eternal salvation. So here's where it is. My forever hope is the basis of my faith. The basis of my faith is hope. It's what lies in the future. It's the expectation of good. It's eternal salvation. Hebrews 11.1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Watch this. Faith amounts, faith amounts to the substance, not of the things we possess. We're saying, oh, God, give me faith. Lord, I, I, I need a new phone. Voila, it's here. No, not of the things that we can see, but it says clearly here that it is confidence. It's, it's what's hoped for. Faith is the confidence, it's being sure that what we hope for will actually happen. That doesn't sound like human hope. When we talk about human hope, we're saying, oh, I hope I can go to Hawaii. Or you say, I hope I can lose weight. Trust me, that's not the confidence of which I hope for that I believe will actually happen. What I'm saying is the Bible hope. It's different. It's saying that I have a confident expectation. And with joy, it accompanies me with joy. I've got some pleasure, not in what I'm going through right now, but what I'm looking forward to. Hope always has rejoicing to it. That's why Paul said we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. That there is a hope beyond what I can see, taste, feel, understand right now. It's the evidence of things not seen. Hallelujah. So you ask how can we rejoice in hope? Hope says no matter what happens here and now, I can hope there right. and later. Praise God. Amen. Amen. So, I told you we're going to look at Abraham today. So go to the book of Hebrews for just a moment, please. Hebrews. And, and Hebrews chapter 6. And so Hebrews chapter 6, here's what we're going to be looking at. As you look at the scripture, you're going to find out that God, his promise, brings hope. God's promise brings hope. Look at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13. If you're there, say amen. Amen. Yep. Did, did they say amen in the living room? Don't you go sleep on me, all right? If you're at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13, <laughs> say amen. Amen. If you're not, 
Find it. Look at verse 13. When God made his promise to Abraham. Check this out. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swear or swore by himself. One translation says, God took an oath in his own name. He swore by himself. You know why he did that? Because there was no one greater for him to swear by. When you look at that right there, it lets you know the ultimate supremacy of God. It lets you know the absolute monotheism, oneness of Scripture. There is no idea implied here of one person in the Godhead swearing by another. It says God swore by himself because there's one God and there's none beside him and there's none greater than him. Yeah. Now what did this one God say? Verse 14. I will bless you and give you many descendants. We found that in Genesis 12. Verse 15 of Hebrews 6 says, And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. Now stay with me. Verse 16. We're going to dig here a minute. Now when people take an oath, I'm reading from the New Living Translation right now, Hebrews 6.16, When people take an oath, they call on someone greater than themselves to hold them to it. And without any question, that oath is binding. Verse 17. God also bound himself with an oath so that those who received the promise could be perfectly sure. Abraham received the promise. You and I have received the promise, or you can today before uh, this broadcast is over. It says those who received the promise could be perfectly sure. Not, oh, I hope so. No, they could be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind. Look at verse 18. So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable. They're unmutable because it's impossible for God to lie. Two things, the promise God made to Abraham and the oath by which God confirmed the promise. He said those two things, he said, God can never lie. Now check this out. Therefore, notice the nature and the definition of hope. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge. Has anybody found refuge in the Lord Jesus Christ? If your world is spinning right now, I want you to know there is a refuge that you can run to. I've experienced it. Oh, so many in, in, in the audience, as it were today, has experienced it. He said, those that have fled to him for refuge can have what? Great confidence great confidence, and hold to the hope that lies before us. So it's confidence and it's futuristic. Look at verse 19. This hope is strong and trustworthy, anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. Jesus had already gone there for us. He has become our eternal high priest, in the order of Melchizedek. Now let's go back to verse 19. This is what I want you to notice. I'll read from the New King James. Hebrews 6, 19. This hope, this hope we have, and he uses a, a, a word picture here, as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. If you put an anchor down, it's something that will, that will hold you in the place that you are. He said, which enters the presence behind the veil. Faith, faith is the rope that tethers us to the anchor of the hope of heaven. When you drop down an anchor, it's attached to a rope when you're on a boat and it goes down and, and that anchor down there is hope. And the rope is, is, is faith. Hope is the anchor of our soul. I, I asked Christina to to sing that great is thy faithfulness. Now I'm going to another old hymn called The Solid Rock. And I want you to know that this author, Charlie Hall, had to have Hebrews 6 in mind. It says, my hope, somebody shout my hope. My hope, my hope is built on nothing less. Do you see that anchor down there? Now I've got some faith, praise God, but, but what holds my faith is that hope down there. He said, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. I can't have more faith than, oh, I hope I can make it. I connect to a God and his righteousness. On Christ's 
the solid rock I stand. Could I say it this way? On Christ, the solid anchor. <laughs> Hallelujah. And then the verse says, when darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. That's Hebrews 6.19. On Christ, the solid rock. Oh, what about the verses prior? His oath. Two things, his promise and his oath. His oath, his covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. Finally, he said, when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found. I'm telling you, Jesus is coming back. And that is a hope in which anchors our soul in the midst of our present life. Yeah. Amen. Now, if you'll turn over to Romans chapter 4, I want to talk about our promise and our hope. The subject's still Abraham. When God made his promise to Abraham. That's what the writer of Hebrews said. So now Paul, in Romans 4, verse 16, turn in there, Romans chapter 4, verse 16, he said, so the promise is received by faith. Anybody want a promise? Abraham's promise, he said the promise is received by faith. It's given us as a free gift. And we are all, here it comes, certain to receive it. Whether or not we live according to the law of Moses, he, he's right in here. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or Gentile. If we have faith like Abraham's, then we can have a certainty of this promise. For Abraham is the father of all who believe. That is what the scripture means when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. This happened because Abraham believed in God, watch this, who brings the dead back to life. Oh, that's resurrection. Who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. That's a new creation. That's the new birth. Praise God. My God, when he was in Christ, the man, uh, Christ Jesus, when he came out of that grave, let me tell you right now, he showed he had resurrection power, but he also showed that he can create us a new yeah. creature. And Paul is saying that Abraham is the father of the faith. Now, Abraham's touted faith was credited to him for righteousness. But again, faith is the basis for hope, but not a human hope. It's a heavenly hope. Drop down to verse 18. I want you to notice the reference to human hope and heavenly hope. Romans 4, 18. Even when there was no reason for hope, some translations say against all hope. When there was no reason, it made no sense to, to, to have any human hope. Yeah. Abraham kept hoping. He kept on believing. He put his faith in hope. He didn't put his faith in his own ability. He put his faith in hope. And the reason I can live today and I can face what I've faced in the last few weeks and I can face whatever God shows or has for me in the next few weeks is because my faith is not in myself. My faith is in an anchor. My faith, I've got to hold on to it. It's tethering down to an anchor. Praise God. And the Bible says that when Abraham had no reason for hope, when all human hope was gone, he hoped in faith. He kept believing that what God said, he's going to become the father of many nations. And he said, that's how many descendants you're going to have. And so he just kept believing and putting his faith in hope. Let me tell you, when you put your faith in hope instead of what God will do right now, oh, are you hearing me? Yeah. We think faith is, oh Lord, deliver me. Oh Lord, you know, cash it in for me. Oh, Lord, send it for me. And I believe God is a God of miracles. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm telling you, there's something greater than that kind of faith. When you put your faith in hope, look at verse 19. Mm. Abraham's faith did not weaken. Sometimes I say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Sometimes my, my faith is not as always as strong as I want it to be. But I've got to get it back anchored in my spirit and my mind to a hope. And when Abraham put his faith in hope, look at verse 19. His faith did not weaken, even though at about a hundred years of age, remember God said, I'm going to make you a great nation. 
He's 100 years old. No baby. He just figured his body was as good as dead. It's quite discerning, eh? And so was Sarah's womb. But hear me. His faith was not in what was visible to a human. His faith was in an invisible hope. Your faith is going to diminish when, when uh, something happens to your hope. But if your faith gets stronger, it's going to be because you put your hope, your excuse me, your faith in hope. It's a confident expectation. So Romans chapter number four, verse 20, it says, Abraham never wavered in believing in God's promise. I'm telling you, you can get the promise if you understand. In fact, the Bible says his faith grew stronger and he brought glory to God and he was fully convinced. That's Bible hope. That's Bible hope. It's not wishful thinking. Fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. Hallelujah. We need some people of God. We need somebody that, that, that wants to know Jesus and wants to be born again. Have to understand that God, if you promised it, then I'm fully convinced of it. But oh God, you know, we're, we're going to take new territory and this happened. I'm telling you, if you're fully convinced, whatever God promised, that's hope. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. And when God counted him as righteous, oh, look at this. It wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit too, assuring us that God will also count us as righteous if we believe in him. Here it comes. The one who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. Now, this next verse, I think it's verse 25. This is the gospel. Are you ready? Gospel's good news. Here's the good news. He was handed over to die because of our sins. He was raised to life to make us right with God. That is the gospel. This passage doesn't use the word hope, but it illustrates hope. It illustrates hope that if you believe that Jesus died if you believe he was buried, if you believe he rose again, enough to apply that to your life through repentance in the, hallelujah, and baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be resurrected in receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's the gospel. Yeah. That's applying the gospel. For Paul said in Romans 8, 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit who dwells in you. This new birth experience, being born again of the water and the Spirit. When you apply His gospel through saying, Lord, I repent. That means that you're right, God, and I'm wrong. I'm going to forsake it. I'm going to turn a 180. I'm going to, I'm going to do it your way. That's repentance. And you are baptized with Him. You're buried with Him in immersed in water, in the name of Jesus Christ. For there is salvation in no other name given among men under heaven, whereby we must be saved. I'm telling you, that's the gospel. And you rise up speaking a new language as a sign that the Spirit is in you. The Bible calls it the, the, uh, speaking an unknown tongue. It's unknown to the speaker, but it's a supernatural work. It's a supernatural sign. I'm telling you, that new birth experience is the promise of the Father. Hallelujah. Let's lift our hearts and hands right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I bless your name, Lord. Help us, oh God, to be anchored to a hope. If there's somebody here that's so confused and they say, Lord, I feel so hopeless, I pray in the name of the Lord that you would help them to understand that if they'll turn to you, there is hope for them. And those of us that experience that new birth, Help us not to forget what we're tethered to in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. One night uh, at a dinner, uh, this man who had spent many summers in Maine he would fascinate his companions by telling his experiences when he used to live in a little town called Flagstaff. So he told this story that this town of Flagstaff was to be flooded 
It was part of a large lake for which a dam was going to be built. And so months before that it was to be flooded for this project, all improvements, all repairs in the whole town just stopped. What was the use of painting a house if it was going to be covered with water in six months? Why repair anything in the village when it's going to be wiped out in just not too distant of a future? So, week by week, as you can imagine, the whole town became more and more unkempt. It just went to seed, became wretched. And the old storyteller ended with this statement. Where there is no faith in the future, there is no power in the present. Where there is no faith in the future, there is no power in the present. And I wonder if our life becomes wretched and our life becomes wayward because every time we want to try to do right and I'm going to do it this time and I'm going to get a little more faith, it just all fails again. We have no power in our present is because we don't have faith in our future. I opened this message with a question. Has anyone ever asked you to pray for more hope? I'm going to end with a question. And that is, do you have your reservation made? What am I talking about? It's what I referenced in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. According to his mercy, he's begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus. But verse 4 said, to an inheritance. It doesn't fade away. Reserved in heaven for you. The Message Bible says it this way. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we've been given a brand new life and have everything to live for, including a future in heaven. But the future starts now. God is keeping a careful watch over us and the future. The day's coming when you're going to have it all. Praise God. Life healed and whole. But until that happens, you, the question is, do you have your reservation? Hope is our anchor. It's reserved in heaven for you. And based on the truth of that reservation, you can place your faith in Jesus Christ. Now, if we make reservations, whether it's for a hotel or a restaurant, we expect to have it waiting for us when we arrive. You look around, somebody check in at the desk, or and they say, well, I'm sorry, I don't have your reservation. Disappointment? Maybe not happy campers. Because we expect when we make a reservation, we expect it. We're confident it's going to be there. We likely don't call every few minutes or hours to see, is my reservation there? You know, you got a family reunion and eight months, make the reservation every day. You still got it? You still got it? No, no, no. Now, you may confirm the reservation when it gets closer, but we live, are you hearing me? We live in faith in the reservation. And we can have a hope, a confident expectation that the reservation is good. Faith, again, is often what God will do for us right now. That's the context that we look at. it. That's in this world, in this present time. But let me tell you, Daniel had a good mix. Excuse me, Daniel chapter 3. It was the three Hebrew children in chapter 3, verse 17. When they're about ready to go in the fiery furnace, they said, Oh God, our king, oh king, our God is able. Faith, he, he, he will do it. Active faith, deliverance. But if he doesn't, but if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down to your idol. You know why? Because this, this furnace and this body, this isn't what it's all about. Oh, hallelujah. Are you hearing me today? We ought to live like, you know what, God? You, you are able. You are willing. You're going to do it. That's have faith. 
In the name of Jesus, let's have faith in his will. God can turn this around, all of this virus. I believe he's a healer. But let me tell you something else. Like the three Hebrew children, if he doesn't, we're not going to bow. We're not going to bend. Why? Because we've got a hope. My faith is, is connected to an anchor of hope. And I'm not going to give in. I'm not going to go crazy because I have a reservation. Hallelujah. If you don't have this hope, I'm asking you, what are you holding on to? What are you holding for? Oh, if I had hope in this life alone, I'd be miserable. But I'm asking you to confirm your reservation yeah. today. What about heaven that's reserved for you if you'll just put your faith in Jesus Christ? Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, praise God. That's why Paul said, Christ in you is the hope of glory. Praise God, praise God. The mystery in a nutshell is this. Christ is in you. Therefore, you can look forward to sharing in God's glory. So my question to you is, do you have a forever hope? Do you have a forever hope? I want us to begin to start praying right now. And if you're a guest with us, somebody can pray for you right now all you got to do is go to bundlelifebaltimore.com slash pray with me if you want somebody to pray with you just go to our website you'll see a click there slash pray with me and when you give us some feedback and when you give us a call back somebody will call right now and begin to pray with you over the phone I know you can pray where you are we're all going to pray where we are but sometimes we just need that extra person to help us, to lead us and, and agree with us. I, I, Abundant Life, you don't have to go on a website. If you have a brother or sister in our fellowship right now that God is speaking to you. Last week when I made that suggestion, two sisters called one another that God had placed each other on their heart and they began to pray on the phone. We can't just have an echo chamber here of you just watching me, but we've got to connect to the Spirit. We've got to connect to one another. You can pray for somebody right now, right, in, in, in where you are, in your living room or your kitchen, but right now it's a house of prayer. Right now, would you ask God to help us? In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, somebody needs a forever hope. Somebody needs a forever hope, Lord. As they're getting online right now, AbundantLifeBaltimore.com slash pray with me. As soon as we get a number, somebody's going to call. Or somebody that's agreeing right now. I believe our children can receive the baptism of your spirit. I believe, Lord Jesus, somebody can pick up the phone and have a prayer time right now with someone. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. That's right. That's it. Go ahead. Make that contact. Pray where you are. In the name of Jesus, I got an announcement. We're not going to stop praying right now. We're not going to stop praying right now. We're praying right here in front of the camera. You're praying on the other side of the camera. You're praying on the phone. In the name of Jesus. Church, we can't wait till we get back on the campus. I'm believing for people to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I'm believing for people to be healed, to be picked up by a hope, by an anchor in the name of Jesus. That's it. Come on. That's it. In the name of Jesus, that's it. Call. Speak the word. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, that's it. Use your voice right now. Use your mouth right now. Don't just meditate. This is the time to call out to God. Speak out loud right now your words. In the name of Jesus. And while you're speaking words in English, God will speak through you in a language you don't know. You say, well, I already have the new birth. Do you have that hope? Steadfast and sure. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 That's it. Come on. Keep on praying. Keep on praying right now. Hallelujah. 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 That's it. We're going to sing and worship. You're going to keep praying. People are going to get healed. People are going to be delivered in the name of Jesus. And if he doesn't deliver us, 